guys see me? How's it going? I know nobody's expecting to see me right now. I figured you could watch this tomorrow when uh, I'm not, because I can't be here tomorrow. Well, I'm going to be here, but I can't be online tomorrow. So I've been listening to a lot of um, Neil Young this morning. Uh, I've got idea for my next uh, favorite strumming groups video, Neil Young's favorite strumming groove. And uh, that my the John Lennon one. Let's see, today's Sunday, and that was uh, for me. It's pretty good. Seven thousand views already, and since it dropped three a.m. my time, I think I had it drop at six a.m. Um, oh no, maybe it was six a.m. my time. So nine o'clock in the morning on Thursday on the East Coast. So uh, anybody out there? Let's see. Oh, we got a few people here. A couple people. Not many. Playbacks 10. How does that? Playbacks 10, I don't get it. Sorry about that. I did a false... Uh, I accidentally um, started the stream or, or scheduled the stream um, on, uh, on Safari, using Safari. And in the past, I've had issues with that. And keeping in mind that YouTube is a Google company and so is Chrome. So I... Um, I went ahead and canceled that one, deleted it. So if anyone was got a notification for that, I'm so sorry. Um, and then I restarted with this one. And I did it about 20 minutes before, just so you, you guys could get a head up, heads up, because I'm not normally here on Sunday morning. Um, normally, I mean, pre-COVID, I would be at church right now, playing a service as we speak. Um, but uh, to obviously, we're pre-recording those. And um, so... So what I've been doing um, to this morning, though, is I was, uh, yesterday I worked all day. I was exhausted at the end of yesterday. In fact, I was telling myself, I need a day off. This needs to be the Sabbath. But being with you guys is kind of like a Sabbath. This is not that hard of work. Uh, if I go over, if I go to two hours, then I, I, I do tend to feel it later. I'm like, why do I have no energy? And I'm like, oh, because I hung out with you guys for two hours. Um, but if, uh, if I can keep it to about an hour and a half today... Um, we'll probably, uh, I'll probably be fine. Um, I'm, I'll, I'm going to try to chill. Like I said, I was kind of excited about 7,000 views and just a, like three, let's see, Thursday to Friday, Friday to Saturday. Yeah, three days. That's pretty darn good for me, um, for my videos. And I have 80,000 subscribers, but that doesn't trans, I wish it translated to 80,000 views the first day I posted a video. And, and for some people, man, you know, people will post videos and they'll have a million views in a week. And it's just, that's, that's really cool. Um, and, you know, I'm, I don't know if I have the, <laughs> the personality and the videography, videography skills to, to justify people like giving me that many views. But uh, I don't know. Rick Beato's look okay. Um, so I, I'm going to do another strumming um, video maybe. Um, I may do it today because I know I have the rest of the day off. Let's see, I'm just filling up my day. I do this all the time. I never get a day off. Um, I've also got some music that I need to write, but in no hurry on that. There's no deadline on that. But the yesterday was, <laughs> it was not Apex Legend. Uh, so, but it was a game. It's a new game that's coming out probably next year. And it's supposed to be really, really big. And it's, it's I, I think I can say that well, I probably shouldn't say anything. I haven't signed an NDA. Sometimes they make me sign NDAs, but I really can't say anything about it. Um, I shouldn't. Um, but it's a, you know, and most of you guys aren't gamers, uh, so I, I'm not, you know, it's not like I would be giving away any major secrets. But, um, uh, but anyway, so apparently, my understanding is that it should keep me busy for the next few months, which is really good to have a, uh, a project that, you know, you're going to be working on a little bit every week. And, um and then the other thing that they are, the nice thing about it, first time ever I've worked on a game and it paid Union. Now, <laughs> Union scale is less than what I normally charge, so I'm, I'm going to ask for double scale so that it can be uh, more of a blessing. The thing about doing games through the Union is there's no back end on it. So when I do a movie or a TV show or even a record and it's through the Union, you keep making money on that. Um, so if I, if I work on a TV show... Um, and I just worked on one that's coming out, um, I think it may be coming out this summer or in the fall. 
It's called uh, Filthy Rich on Fox, and it's a sitcom. Well, it's kind of a dramedy, I think, a dark comedy or a drama. I'm not sure, uh, but I, I worked on it um, a little bit, and so as long as that show is still generating revenue, as long as this, like, season one that I'm on, as long as that's still generating revenue, then every year on July 1st, is a, I get a, a check um, that's the cumulative of all the things to work on, and it's been... Everything from a couple hundred bucks to several thousand dollars. And I have friends. I know someone who made a quarter million every July 1st. Well, I don't know him personally. Uh, he's the father-in-law of a good friend of mine. And he just recently passed away. I mean, like I say recently, it's probably been 10 years now or eight years. And his name was Frank Morocco. <laughs> and he played accordion. And you're like, wait, what? Accordion? Yeah, he. if you ever heard accordion on anything, the TV or film or even records from the 50s to... He was working until he died and um, just a few years ago. And uh, it was probably him. He did all the accordions on the Godfather series, all three movies. And so you know how much that aired. But like if you heard accordion, uh, you know, if there was a, a band, playing, somebody playing accordion on The Love Boat, you know, he. so you would get residuals from all that it's just crazy you know this is a this is a martin this is a 70s uh martin d35 generally rob the way you can tell a, a 35 from a 25 or 28 is that a 35 and i somebody said the three and 35 stands for three piece back so if you look at a back of a 28 it'll have a two piece back um uh, so i mean i don't know because a 45 doesn't have four piece back so i i'm not sure if that's true or not uh, but it's definitely one of the... And this thing was an abused child. You can see the pick guard. I had my guy kind of glue this down, um, and it just popped right back up. So I don't really care. I use it in the studio mostly. Um, uh, well, I use it in my videos, too, and people go, man, you got to get that guitar fixed. And at some point, maybe I should just have to take it off and put a new one on. Because you can see it even is like either look... It's got, well, Yeah, you can see a little bit right here where there's a little bit of a rim around it, like it... Um, it's too small. And so maybe this is not the original pick guard. Um, there, there also, there was um, a, the nut got moved, which I've heard a couple things. One thing, somebody thought that maybe this was a right-handed or left-handed guitar that got turned into a right-handed guitar. Um, and that could be because the saddle, which is, you know, it, it's slightly diagonal this way. Okay. But it, there's a there's wood filler in there on either side of the saddle that shows that it was going the other way. Um, and so that tells me it was probably a lefty that someone took out, took this out, filled it in or made a piece, put it in there, you know, glued it in, and then cut out a new groove and put in this. Um, I got this for a pretty good steal. I mean, I was looking for a Martin. And, um, and the other thing that was bet wrong with it was there's clearly been repairs along here. There's cracks on the uh, binding of the fretboard. Um, so maybe the guitar fell. It's not, there's no repair on the headstock that I can tell. Um, and then these are Grovers. I don't know if those are originals or not, um, but I, li I like these Grover tuners. Um, but, uh, yeah, like a multi-scale, maybe. And I, you know, the other thing was I heard that, that uh, Martin's, 70s Martin's had intonation issues. And that a lot of people had had repairs done on them. So this may be one that's been pre-repair on that, which I got this at Guitar Center, and I, it was eleven hundred dollars. And you know, I think it was because it was because of the pick guard really kind of made them knock it down. But it was pretty um, uh, pretty good. You know, it was already worked in. Now I need a fret job. Um, I may need the neck to be reset too by my guy, but that's a kind of expensive job. I was work. I was using it last night on a, on that game, and we decided to double everything I did on the electric. We decided to double it with acoustic, and I think at one point I was fret fret way up here, and I was having trouble getting. It. Yeah. No, Rob, that's exactly right. I mean, when you play a guitar, <laughs> hey, Pepper. Oh, sorry. So how many people do we have watching? Oh, 18. I, I don't expect many. I, Pepper, I can't, I can't do tomorrow. Um, that record I told you about that I might have been doing on Friday, um, I think we're going to start tomorrow. I'm pretty darn sure. If we don't, then I may go ahead and um, 
I may go ahead and um, uh, log in tomorrow and if I've got something to say. <laughs> you know I do. <laughs> I always have something to say. And look at my hair. Oh my gosh. My hair has something to say. Um, and uh, so it, I just, I, I didn't want to have, I didn't want to interrupt because I'm going to be doing the session here. We're going to be recording guitars for that, uh, that, the, that uh, Mexican artist, uh, Marco Antonio. And um, so we're going to start, start the first song tomorrow. Um, and so uh, the producer's going to come here and we're going to track guitars. Uh, the producer's a very good friend of mine. They've had dinner over in the last, he and his wife have had dinner over several times since COVID started. Um, they're like family. Um, and yes, I love beat up guitars. I mean, I just love it. I mean, you know, I, I have too many guitars that most of them don't ever get to this point because I'm, I'm playing and this one kind of came already beat up a little bit. Um, and I mean, to me, it's like, I, I remember when I was teaching click one time and I was, uh, I had my, my, uh, capo on the headstock. And someone in the clinic, and you know, it's, it was always funny teaching those clinics because at first I was so nervous because I was, let's see, I started in 97, so I was 36 years old. And, um, you know, the average age of the attendees were old, was probably 40, 45, something like that. So there'd be 45, 50 year old guys sitting in the front row with their arms crossed, like, impress me, punk, you know. And I never even tried. I never even tried to impress anyone. I'm not, because I knew that if I tried to do all, you know, tried to do like, you know, uh, okay, I need my thumbpick. But uh, let's see. oh, if I drop my thumb pick, that's two drinks, two sips. If I try to do country boy or something like that, I would totally flub it up, and then you just look like an idiot. So um, I didn't even try to impress. But one one of the guys that was sitting there with his arms crossed, he was kind of all looking at me disapprovingly, and he said, "You know, you shouldn't put." And I had a tailor, you know, the the tailor that I was given to do the clinics. It was a, my A14. He goes, you know, you shouldn't clip your capo on the headstock because it'll damage the logo. And it was just like, I, I, I was kind of like, you know, the thing that, <laughs> the, I don't know, I feel like the Holy Spirit gave me the words. I just said, I don't care. <laughs> I said, I really don't care. I said, it's more valuable for me to have it there than to have it sitting somewhere I can't find it and I'm trying to lead worship. And then the other thing I said was, look, I mean, who are you going to respect more? Uh, a soldier with a shiny brand new sword or, or a soldier with a bloody <laughs> dinged up sword? Yeah, the guy with the brand new sword, I'm not going to be too afraid of, but the guy with the dinged up bloody sword, yeah, that's the guy I'm going to fear. So I'm really, I, I really do feel like dinged up guitars are a badge of honor. And I, you know, I, I, all of us hate getting the first ding on a brand new guitar. All of us hate getting the first ding on a brand new car. But it's inevitable. Now, <laughs> a beat up car, I don't necessarily consider a badge of honor. <laughs> when my car gets too beat up, it's like, yeah, I'll let it be someone else's problem. Time for me to buy a new car. Um, I don't know where you're at on that, but I, you know, at some point, I, you know, my car is 10 years old now, so I, but I hardly ever drive. So it's, hey, uh, <laughs> Gear View Drive, Gear View Mirror, I love that name. Renee, what's going on? Oh. Well, no, there's dots on the top, though, too. But you're right. You know, that's another indicator that this was probably a left-handed guitar. I'm pretty sure this was a left-handed guitar. Which, But the thing is, is that I'm not seeing any indication here that there was a... Usually you would see... So they must have refinished the top. Because I usually would see an indication that there was a pickguard here. But I'm not seeing anything on the finish that would betray that it was a pickguard. But that's a great... Somebody else pointed that out to me, and I totally forgot that. But they also put them here. So then whoever did the thing... And then, look, the, the dots go all the way down to the um, 17th fret. But here they only go to the 12th fret. But it's a double dot there. That's so fascinating, isn't it? kind of would love to know the history of this guitar. I mean, it's a 70... It's a mid-70s. Is there a serial number on this? Um, yeah, it's a serial number. So I could probably get the exact date. I don't know if Fender, if Martin is, 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 uh, religious about their serial numbers. Gibson's super religious about their serial But I've used this on a million records, and, uh, keep, I mean, I, it's just my main guitar that I keep out all the time, so... Um, let's 
let's see. Yeah, it's a sign of use, exactly right, you know. And my car is in pretty cherry shape still for a 10-year-old car. Uh, your harmonies like that, Greg? Yeah, it's... Uh, um, Greg, was it you that couldn't get that, that link uh, to the... I'm going to create the link. I discovered something, guys, and I, I don't know. Uh, before I do this, though, Dennis... Is Dennis on? Dennis is not on, I don't think. I don't think we have any moderators on. Um, I'm going to create a link. Um, and I, ha I didn't see this, but there's a little box there when I go to get my link for the Discord. So, Greg, here's, here's the Discord link if, you, if that was you asking me for it. I can't remember who it was. Um, and that's only good for a little bit. They expire. And so... Consequently, this chat stays with the video and people click on that link and it's expired and they're like, oh man, what happened? And I'm like, dang it. But there is a box there I can say, create a link that doesn't expire. But what I want to do is I want to make sure with Dennis that that's okay because then we have all these links out there that don't expire. Um, and that's fine because we can always, if somebody's being a jerk in the, the chat room or in the group, we can always get rid of them and ban them and uh, it's been done. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my, yeah, exactly. It's my, this is my, this is my bloody sword, you know? Um, and I was just watching, cause I, I, I was just saying how, how, how pleased I am that my, my John Lennon video is doing so well. It's already got 7,000 views, which is pretty good for me. I mean, 7,000 views on a video for me is pretty good. I mean, I've got, obviously I've got two and a half million on the one and I've got several in the high hundred thousand, you know, like almost million views. Um, and then, and then it kind of drops off and, and I've got several in the, you know, 50,000, 30,000 range that are usually gear reviews. Those are the ones that, and you know, basically I, it pays about a third a penny, third of a penny per view. So you think those million ones, it's like, wow, you know, that's like three grand and it's true. You make a, about three grand for a million views if it's at, you know, you have advertising and stuff. So, um, and, uh, so that's pretty cool, but I mean, I only have one video that's over three. Uh, three million views. I mean, over a million views. Um, but uh, the fact that I got to seven thousand views in just a, a few days, I think the Neil Young one will be even more popular. So I'm get. I'm. I'm. I actually found multiple songs that use kind of the similar groove. Again, I'm not going to state that this is the only groove he uses or these are all identical grooves. But there is a thing that he does, and I'll talk about that when I do the video. There is a thing that he does that he kind of gravitates towards, and. Um, uh, so hopefully, you know, at this point, I, I'm not playing enough of the songs um, that there, I was a little worried when I played uh, Norwegian Wood um, on the John Lennon video, just I played the, like the little snippet of it. I tried to keep it under seven or 15 seconds. Um, I was a little worried that it might get a copyright infringement, which would be a bummer, but um, it didn't. So, um Shoot, okay. So now you've got another one, or... Uh, so, so Gear, can you, have you been able to get that link? Another thing I noticed, and a friend of mine, um, Brad Coleman, was helping me out, and another thing I noticed on the Neil Young grooves is that while his right hand may kind of be very consistent about doing this one groove he really likes, um, uh, and I mean, the groove is, I can play for you. I'm not, let's see, what was the, um, uh, like, it's like. He likes that boom, boom, chuck, a boom, boom, chuck, a boom, boom, chuck, bah. He loves that groove. He does that a lot. And uh, so that's the one I'm going to talk about. While his right hand can be a little pretty consistent doing that a lot, his left hand is crazy busy and really cool. And so I might actually down the road kind of do a little analysis of some of the licks that Neil Young does, likes to do with his left hand. And it almost might have to be by song, not by song, but more by chord. Um, so like if he plays D minor this way, he does a lot of stuff like that. But if he plays like, you know, he plays a song that's in B minor. He does more of that kind of stuff. So I might do a video on his left hand shenanigans. And uh, I think that would be pretty cool. And Neil Young, I want, I guess, I guess you could say Neil Young was influential on me uh, as more, like I said, more as a songwriter 
um, than as a guitar player. I really didn't even ever notice his guitar playing. Um, and I was a big Neil Young and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young fan. Um, I have um, a Martin, my 20, 1924 Martin, um, that's, in the, that's packed away right now. Um, and I used it on church this weekend, actually. So you, if you watch our church service, you can see, Oh, did I play? I, I don't know if, I, if they showed that video. I don't know if that song got in the... What's, I have to think about it. Um, but uh, supposedly, and they, di they, didn't, they didn't promise it. They didn't have any paperwork to prove it. They didn't have any photos to prove it. Uh, I went to a very reputable guitar store, though, in Los Angeles. Um, but supposedly this guitar had belonged to Stephen Stills. Now, he's owned hundreds... I mean, at one time, I think he's owned 400 guitars. So he probably wouldn't even remember if he saw it. Um, but, and they didn't try to say, you know, well, we're going to add, you know, $5,000 to the value of this guitar because it was owned by Stephen Stills. Uh, and, but it's the kind of guitar he would very likely own. Um, and it's, a, a, like I said, it's an old Martin. Uh, the thing I love about it, it doesn't even have the decal up here. It has the, the stamp on the back, which is really cool. Um, Well, you know, Rob, um, Rob is asking, why not do some of Paul McCartney's acoustic songs? Um, I, it, it, his are a little bit harder. Um, I don't find anything particularly consistent with his. So what, because what I, the, the, the series is, you know, Blank's favorite groove. Like Jack Johnson is one I'm going to do. Now, you know, I mean, Jack Johnson, but he's got this, you know, he goes, um, Was it? Uh, what would be that? He does that on a lot of songs. So that will be, you know, so because he did it so consistently, Paul gravitated towards, like, you know, he would do finger picking. So that's one song, but I don't think he did. Oh, um, let's see. What we, there is one that he did that was probably similar. And what is that? He would do. He would do that kind of. And that's not surprising, considering he's a bass player. He, he brings out the bass. Yesterday, right? Let's see. Uh, let's remember. Um, he would kind of bring out the bass. That makes sense. And then, of course. And that one is more, it's funny because I taught that one uh, Blackbird wrong for years and years and years and years. Um, he does more of a kind of a, he does more of like a brushing thing. And I didn't really notice it until I started listening to John Mayer play and John Mayer likes that groove. So that might be one where I could try to teach that John Mayer groove, um, which is, which is kind of a, I want to say it's a simplification of, um, I think, of, uh, of the Travis pattern. I th We talked about the Travis pattern weeks ago. Um, I think with Paul McCartney, it was that he was trying to get the Travis pattern sound, but he didn't know how to do it, so he came up with that. And he liked the backbeat that he put on. And then I think John Mayer intentionally did that, because I know John Mayer can do the Travis pattern, no problem. Um, but he likes that, you know, like that, you know, kind of sound. The Also, uh, also who uses that one a lot is um, Ed Sheeran. So that might be one of the ones, you know, that I could totally do. In fact, I should probably put John Mayer and Ed Sheeran on my list. I've got my list right here. Because um, I'm mostly looking at older artists. Um, uh, but I'm just coming up with names at this point, and then I'm going to do, re it, it requires research. So it's kind of, um, let's see, two E's in Sheeran. Okay, and then also John Mayer. Um, and if I, if I do the um, Sheeran one, that'd probably be very popular. Um, but I, I've got in my list, and, I, and I'm only beginning to do the research on these, so Dylan is hard. I don't think he ever does the same groove twice. I don't think he does the same groove in two consecutive measures. So he's really, really tough. His right hand is, he's a, got a great right hand, but he's just not consistent. Uh, the Eagles, I'm trying to think of, Eagles are probably, it's going to be similar to John Denver, where they're doing like, um, I touched my face so we can take a sip. I have 
uh, there's we have a drinking game if you're new to the channel, um, and the game is if I. Um, basically, we're right around ten rules. We call them the the Tom Command <laughs> Command Sips, <laughs> the, the Tom Command Sips instead of the t Ten Commandments. That's Gary. Gary's our punster. He's our resident punster. He's not. I don't see Gary here yet, but. Uh, if I touch my face, if I refer to myself in the third person, if I use air quotes, uh, if I drop a pick, that's a sip. If I drop a thumb pick, that's a double sip. If I leave the room, that's a sip. If I say I had a band in high school called fill in the blank, that's a sip. I ha actually, I did have a high school band. I, I said I had a band in high school called I had a band in high school called. <laughs> it took a sip. Um, let's see what else. Oh, if I mentioned that I played on Apex, that I did all the guitars on Apex Legends, uh, then you take a sip. So that's a braggadocia sip. I love that word, braggadocia. Um, right? You're right. If I even put Eagles in the name, you're, you know what? I'm probably not going to do the Eagles. And the, and the stupid thing, they're so stupid about this. Cause like, I mean, I'm not big, but, but Rick Beato, when they do takedown notices on, he's advertising for them for free. People are listening, and, and the way you make money now is streaming, okay? Just so you know, money is made on streaming. It's not sales. Nobody's, hardly anyone's downloading songs. I got a new song out, by the way. And uh, my Christian viewers are gonna be really mad. But I, did, I don't write top lines, you know that. And once I write something, I, I, I get it to these producers and I don't know what they're gonna put on top of it, so. Uh, but a song dropped uh, by this artist named Benny Maine. And uh, I, I can't even say the name of it, <laughs> of the song. And I'm like, why did you call it that? They can't put it on the radio. Well, the, shoot, they'd be bleeping out every other word. But it's Benny Maine, and the song is I Ain't Something. I'm not going to say the something. But it begins with S, and it's a four-letter word. So you can figure it out. But if you want to look it up on YouTube... Um, I, if you go, if you, if you watch it, if you watch it, cause it, it's my guitar. Um, it's this guitar actually. Um, and, um, it's just me and him basically. And Sam Hook wrote the top line on it and he's a, he's a major label artist. So I, I, they're dropping the singles. The album comes out next Friday. Ugh, touching my face again. My nose itches. Um, the whole record comes out next Friday, but they released this one. Which is cool because I think almost it gets treated like a single. Hopefully we'll get a lot of spins. Um, but the... Uh, uh, that's exactly what I think, Gear. Uh, because, like I said, when, when Rick Beato, to his million and a half subscribers, talks about King Crimson, of all people, okay? When he talks about King Crimson, there is a vast majority of his followers that have never bought a King Crimson record, okay? So that's the biggest majority. There's a, still probably a majority of his viewers that have never listened to a King Crimson song. Now, I've listened to a lot of King Crimson, but I don't think I've ever bought a King Crimson record. Um, and, th and so you've got million people suddenly exposed to this band that, that who if you go to their if you go to their Spotify page and the thing is about Spotify if you look at the page you know you can see spin numbers right and I bet you King Crimson's maybe got a few in the millions but most of their songs are in the two you know the hundred thousands so he could potentially and a million spins on Spotify generates about seven thousand dollars for the artist and for the writers and it's I, I'm not I don't quote me on that number I heard it from Someone who works with, uh, someone who's uh, in, oh shoot, I can't think of the band. Pretty big band. Not so much the band is big, but the, uh, is it Ryan Tedder's? It may be Ryan Tedder's band. Uh, One Republic, is that Ryan Tedder's band? So Ryan's got millions of, hit, you know, he's got a ton of hits. Um, and so he's he works with him. And um, so that's the beauty of it. If you do release, like if you release 10 songs on YouTube, I mean, on, on Spotify, um, and they, at, you know, 10 songs average 100,000 views each. Well, you know, we got 10 grand coming because if you're the label and you're the writer and you're the artist, you get all the money. 
Um, so my understanding is that $2,000 goes to the copyright holders, which are the writers and publishers, split 50-50. And if I own the song and am the publisher as well, then that's I get all, all of that $2,000. Um, and then seven, the five thousand goes to the label, and the label then has to pay the producers. They also have to pay the writers. It's called a mechanical royalty, so they pay a mechanical royalty, um, and then they also have to pay the artists, and then they have to pay their bills. And so, but the labels love it because they they don't have distributors to deal with because distributors would typically take twenty five percent of the. So generally, like if you bought a CD at Target for. $10, Target's making $4. If it lists for $10, Target makes $4, and then $6 goes to everybody else. Well, that $6, 25% of that goes to the distributor. So now you're taking that down to $4.50, and then of that $4.50, there's a producer point on every song. So those the producers have to get paid, and then you've got 9.1 cents if it's a 10-song CD. That's 91 cents that has to go to the writers and publishers. So you can see where, I mean, label, you know, everybody complains about labels, but... They put a lot of money into promoting the product, and then they're left with two or three dollars on a CD. Potentially, the artist may get a dollar of that. If it's a big artist, they may get almost all of it. Um, or even more likely, they got a giant advance. Um, and then the advance, you, it's money. It's essentially, advances are money you owe somebody. You pay that back. So if an artist gets a forty million dollar advance, then they don't get any more money from the record company until they pay that back, essentially. But. Uh, 80, about 80 kilos. Oh, is that, is that um, what seven grand is? Or are we talking about drugs now? Yeah, exactly, uh, Gear. I mean, it's, it's, uh, so, so when Rick Beato talks about, and he got a, he got a, like a takedown notice for, for King Crimson. I was like, and he does a, he did a live stream about it. I haven't finished watching it yet, but he actually got their, the number of the people that did the takedown. And they were in Russia, and he calls them, and he's like, why did you take this down? And it was like nine seconds. Uh, and so uh, ah, I think I have to shave my beard or something. It's getting scratchy. So, um, so yeah, so I don't really understand why they do the takedown thing. Um, you know, this, I titled this My Favorite Guitar Players, but we've just been chit-chatting, or I've been ch chit-chatting. Um, and so, but I can continue with that, with that list that we were talking about. And I, I kind of caught you all up to about the point where I moved to L.A. Uh, the, the, like I said, the guitar players that really were big influences on me were guitar players that I personally knew, you know, that, that were either friends of my sisters or guitar teachers that I had um, when I went to I went to Butler University and I went for one year but I kept taking because I just I couldn't keep my grades up I had 40 students a week which is 20 hours a week in Carmel Indiana so it, you know it took me a while to get up there and everything so it was that was five days a week I was teaching and then I had a band that was playing almost every Friday and Saturday night and practicing many many Tuesdays and Thursdays and that was on the south side of town so I'd have to drive down you know so I just wasn't studying enough. I couldn't keep my grades up. And um, so, but one of the things that I did uh, really, really um, enjoy and, and I was getting a lot out of was my private classical guitar instruction because I was a music major with a guitar principal. You, you basically, you, you had your principal instrument and then your second instrument would almost always be piano. So you, you had to have a, two instruments. And so uh, if you were a piano player, then it would be something else, obviously. But um, but the, um, if you were majoring in any instrument and mine was guitar, then, um, your secondary instrument would be piano. So, but my guitar teacher, Brett Terrell still works there, I believe, uh, still teaches at Butler. And he, um, he, he I, I've told you about this, you know, he told he was in my audition and I was so nervous. And I think I may have played Misty, you know, like my, my other teacher that really influenced me. Uh, Scott Valentine showed me, and I probably did like. Which is the arrangement of um, Bach's Vak It Off, um, which is, it just sounds wrong, but it means sleepers awake. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, that was, uh, that arrangement was done by Christopher Parkening. And um, so I transcribed it note for note and um 
I had, uh, and he, he, I would say that Christopher Parkney was a big influence on me, classical guitar wise, um, just because his, his, his kind of uh, almost pop approach to classical guitar music, um, he didn't do like strings and stuff like that. It was just like solo guitar, but he picked the top, you know, it was always the top 20 songs. He's always picking the ones and he'd be like, oh, that's a beautiful box, you know. And I mean, I transcribed that when I was 14, 15 years old and I still remember it. So that's a huge influence. Uh, but Brett, he was the one, he said, I, my left hand got me into the school and my right hand almost kept me out. He said my right hand was collapsing. So I was kind of playing like, kind of playing like Chet Atkins and, and Merle Travis. I was collapsing my hand. So my whole freshman year of college, my only memory is of Brett going, no, <laughs> no. Just like sitting there, no, it's just bending my wrist back so that I would play with proper technique. And uh, it's funny because I can still play with both techniques. Just itchy today. What is that? You can see I got a bunch of guitars all facing me. That was because I was working on so much stuff last night where I was, um, the flow that I was doing um, for this thing was I was recording phrase by phrase. And then so I would do like an eight bar phrase on the banjo. And then I would play it on, uh, or that's a six string banjo, so it plays like a guitar. And then I would play it on the, the acoustic, and then I would play it on the, the nylon. And that way I just had them handy. So I could just pick them up, play, pick it up, play, pick it up, play. And that's why I just surrounded myself with guitar so I wouldn't be getting up to do this. And, and the problem with getting up, when you sit back down, you may not sit back down in front of the microphone the same way it was. So I really was trying to like minimize my movement and not get up until I finished this entire long, long thing of, it was probably, I'd say 12 different, very, very difficult phrases to play on guitar. And, um, uh, and you know, requiring all sorts of capoing and retuning the guitar to make them work. And of course, you know, they were written by a keyboard player, so they don't, and I'm fine with that. I like to try to emulate that as much as I can. If they heard this melody, I try to, I try to get that down. Um, but um, the, uh, hey, Mark, Jim, I, well, I got to say hi to everybody, too. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and I'm doing this today because I won't be able to do it tomorrow, by the way. If you're wondering why the heck I'm doing this on a Sunday, it was like, you know, I was sitting there. We just finished watching church service, uh, the 9 o'clock service. And I was like, you know what? I should go on at 11 and do my live stream because I can't do it tomorrow because Pablo's coming over. And we're going to start recording Marco Antonio's record. So. He's a big Mexican artist. I think he's number three historic overall. Uh, maybe Julio Iglesias or Enrique Iglesias. And then it's, well, I can't remember, but Marco's big. And super, super duper nice guy. Um, and Pablo, his, one of his main producers, probably his main producer, um, is, uh, is a very, very dear friend of ours, so mine. So, but yeah, I had these good, so I could just grab them and do it. And uh, I was sitting here for a couple hours. I was so exhausted after. And I mean, I was, I, uh, at that point, I'd already been spent six hours in my studio working on these, this one cute, this one song and, um, and three hours the day before, um, because three hours, the day before we thought he, the composer thought we were going to do it all with ukulele. So I was playing all these ukulele things and then they, the, the producer said, no, don't like it. And he goes, okay, totally redoing it. <laughs> so we had to start from scratch. Uh, and it was, it was really, really hard reading. Um, uh, but I, I managed to get through it. And that the reason, a little pro tip here, the reason, um, before I think, the reason why I pulled out the, the six-string banjo so I could just play it like a guitar. So if I capoed it, if I retuned it or whatever, it was all just like whatever I did to this guitar. Um, and so... Uh, that made it faster. Um, the other thing was, though, that um, once I did all the work to figure out the best way to finger, out, finger this, like, say, eight-bar phrase, and even some of the eight-bar phrases I had to punch in the middle because it was like, there's no way I can, I can get from here to there, you know. Um, but that way, I could, once I had it down on the steel string, then I could pick up the nylon, do, figure it out on nylon, and then pick up the banjo. I always, put, I always did the banjo second, and I'll tell you why. Because I, I would do nylon, say... And then I'd replay the phrase with the banjo. And then I'd replay the phrase with the acoustic. Now I've got the acoustic in my hand. I'd do the next phrase on acoustic and then put it down, pick up the banjo, and then pick up the, the nylon. And then I would do the next phrase with the nylon. You know, I'd go back and forth that way. Uh, just the minimum of movement with the microphone, 
the speed, speed, you know, and I'm charging me that by the hour, but I still want to get things done fast because uh, they're waiting for the files um, and you get a reputation to be able to get things done quickly and that's a good, a good thing. Um, I try to do, you know, they say, well, you, you want it cheap, fast, or good. And I always give fast and good. <laughs> I never am going to give away on cheap. Um, so, but that's what people pay me for is, is to, you know. And the other thing is, um, the other thing is, if I were to go into the studio and do this, you would have to rent the studio and pay an engineer. And the composer would have to be sitting there. So four, you'd have basically have three people, you'd have to pay three people plus a studio to, to get this done. And it's so much more uh, cost effective to have me do it from home if I can get good enough quality. So that's kind of the industry, little industry thing. So I know I got way off track. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Cape Town. I'm, I told you, uh, Rob, that uh, my best friend growing up, his mom, and she calls me every now and then, God bless her. She's such a sweet lady. She's 80, I think. And she, it's like one of those few voices that, that from my childhood, you know? Um, and uh, she still calls and wants to know how I'm doing. And she's a lovely lady. And she, I think, was from Johannesburg. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so let me just say hello. Who's here? I want to see who all is here. Pepper. Pepper, you're here? <laughs> Bruce. Okay, we got a moderator. I had a question for a moderator, but I don't see Dennis here. Dennis isn't here, right? I don't see Dennis. It's real easy to find Dennis because your you, your your name is Blue. Uh, so my question, Bruce, and it's, it's like I said, this is more for Dennis. Is if I put, w would he recommend not putting a, um, a permanent? Because because I just noticed on the Discord where I can create a link. In fact, I'll create a new link right now while I'm talking about it. Um, but I, there's a little box there, and I just noticed yesterday that says, set this link to never expire. Um, and I just don't know if, if that's something that, um, here's a one that will expire. Um, I don't know if that's something we want to avoid. Um, hey, Diane's here. Uh, oh, Colin, what's going on? Good to see you. Um, so we have Jan's here. Gary, oh, Gary uh, Clodfelter. Say yo. Where are you from? Uh, and then Rob is here. Rob's been, let's see, Pepper, Charlie, Bruce, David Sillers. Um, getting all hip and saying Joe Bird. My cousin had a car dealership in Joe Bird. Oh, wow. Uh, let's see. Who else is here? Mark Cragen. How's it going? Mugu Mugu. Good to see you. Oh, I can't believe how many of you showed up today. I did this because I'm not going to be able to do it tomorrow, and I figured anyone who wanted to and they needed to get their Tom fix could watch tomorrow. Uh, let's see. Who else is here? Uh, Gear, Gearview Mirror. I still like that. And Greg Ellis. I don't know if Greg is still there. And Diane's here. I saw Diane. You're here. Waiting for a story. Um, again, this... I haven't even started talking about... Well, I did mention a little bit about my favorite guitar players. But, uh, so, or my most influential guitar players. Uh, favorite guitar players, that's a different list, but most influential. Um, and I need to go through the list to see how many of these I've met. You know, obviously the ones that were directly influential in my life. Uh, John Dinwiddie, I mentioned him. Scott Ballantyne, Brett Terrell. I didn't mention Rob, Doug Wiley. But Doug Wiley um, is a very, one of my best friends. Uh, just before I moved here, he was in my, he was a, a best, or a groomsman in our wedding. And he taught at the same studio I taught. And Doug, his facility was like Alan Holdsworth. Like, he could do insane stuff. And, like, it would drive me crazy because he would, like, I would be with teaching a student and he would have, his student would have canceled. And so he'd be over there practicing. I'd just hear him doing stuff. I'm just like, holy cow, how do you do that, you know? And he went on to become a, a computer genius. He's like a bit, he's like pretty big time, like, computer security guy. Um, and he won't even, I don't think he can even tell me what he does for a living. Um, but he, I think he got all the way through Berkeley and Boston, Berkeley School of Music. He got like to the last class and he quit. <laughs> he quit with one class to go and then just started from scratch. Go, no, I want to do computers. So uh, he was smart. I mean, because the guitar path is a very tough path, especially in Indiana. If you're going to stay, that's why I couldn't stay in Indiana. So, but these are all people, obviously I met, you know. Uh, of the Beatles, I've not met any of the Beatles, uh, unfortunately. Um, 
I could have met George on multiple occasions, and it's I don't have many regrets in life, but that's definitely one of my regrets. Um, my next door neighbor in the building that we managed in Pasadena managed um, was the stage manager at Pasadena City College, and every year, every year, uh, um, Ravi Shankar would do a uh, and count, you know, in Los Angeles, kind of like a, a Indian music festival. And every year, you know, after the day after, my neighbor Tim would say, "Oh, you should have come. I invited you. You should have come." Uh, George Martin or George uh, Harrison showed up and hung out and played and everything. I'm like, "Oh, dang it! Well, remind me next year." And then next year he reminds me, and I'm like, "Oh, I can't. I'm busy." Or oh, I, I don't know if I want to sit through four hours of Indian music or you know whatever. And and you know. Being friends with Tim, I could just hang out backstage. So I could have met all sorts of people. Um, and I just should have done it. And I, I really regret that. I'm so bummed that I didn't do that. Um, yeah, I hear Paul's really approachable. And I do have lots of friends that know him and work with him. And uh, a, a good friend of mine is, is a left-handed guitar dealer. And will often have dealings with Paul or his team. Um, have any of you met any of the Beatles? There's actually a website that set, has, it's just for Beatles stories of people meeting Beatles. And particularly if you met them during when they were the Beatles, that's those are great stories because it's like what? Um, my grandmother, before Beatlemania, went to England, and when she came back, um, she had a forty-five that my cousin still has, and it was I think "Love Me Do" from nineteen sixty-three, and she was like, "These people are." Everywhere and the Beatles are really big and like like you know my my I was two years old, but my you know there were the, a lot of my cousins were a lot older and they were like going who is it and it's like how did Grandma know about the Beatles? Um, uh, yeah, oh, you, I've never even been to well yeah who not many people got to go to the Beatles live shows because they stopped doing shows I think in '66 and they didn't do that many to begin with, although they were the first to do the the stadium show so. People that did get to go were with a lot of other people. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, Bruce. Yeah, I just think I just think it's probably not a good idea to have links that don't expire out there. The only thing is that you know I'm a moderator, and so is I think um, so is Dennis, and I don't know who else is. Um, and they can, if anybody's getting really snarky on there, they, we can block them. So that's not necessarily a problem. Um, oh, the stories in Quora, right? Beetle experts. Yeah, I've seen some of those. Um, let's see. But, um, and I've told you this, I teach Cruz Beckham <laughs> guitar lessons. And in fact, I need to text and we need to do another lesson. And I, you know, I used to go to their house in Beverly Hills, but they don't, the Beckhams don't live in Beverly Hills anymore. I'm talking about David and Victoria. And, um, uh, so uh, I teach him on online, but he was, we were talking and, and he goes, Oh, can, can I learn Blackbird by the Beatles? And he goes, I said, sure, you could totally play that Blackbird. And I start showing it to him. He goes, yeah, my, my, my friend's grandpa wrote that. And I went, I started thinking for a second. I went, Oh yeah, Victoria is in fashion. So is, uh, Stella McCartney is very good designer. Um, and, uh, so they're friends, and so Cruz is friends with Stella McCartney's son, <laughs> and they go over to Stella McCartney's house, and he goes, yeah, sometimes uh, my friend's grandpa is sitting at the piano just playing and singing songs and stuff. I'm just like, are you freaking kidding me? It's just like, you know, Cruz is probably like playing with Legos, or <laughs> it's like, oh, whatever, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, it just blows my mind. But, you know, you forget, you know, your heroes, these celebrities, you know, I am a normal person. You forget this. <laughs> I have a normal life. Most of my life, almost most of my life is not spent in front of a camera. Yeah, his voice is getting a little raspy. It's hard. And they, you know, I, I noticed on Neil Young, was I, I was watching these videos, and I found a, new, a recent one of him playing live because I wanted to watch his right hand. And he did um, Southern Man down a whole step. And I, I think his tuning was tuning the guitar down a whole step and then tuning the bottom two strings down another whole step. So he must have had really heavy strings on that guitar. But I was trying to figure out how he was playing these chords. And um, I think he was doing something like that. So, um, But anyway, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm hoping that... I've told, I just told you this, that I'm hoping in, in 
in the spring, I'm going with the with the composer that I work for uh, with uh, 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 Apex Legend. Um, that uh, we got a different game that we're working on, and I'm he wants me to come to Abbey Road for like two or three days. So we're going to be in Studio Two for two or three days. Supposedly, we'll see. Um, you'll be the first to know. Uh, and uh, in Studio Two, where the Beatles did all the recordings, and we're just going to rent a bunch of amps and a bunch of guitars. And my goal, my, they just want me to make noise, like as crazy noises. So I'll be bringing all sorts of weird. I mean, I, hopefully, I can bring some of the stuff I want to bring. That's funny. We may have to stop by the, because uh, you can make noise with all sorts of things and. I may have to stop by a hardware store in London before we go to the studio so I can buy a bunch of crap. Um, uh, oh, Brian. Uh, yes, Brian. Is, is it Brian May? Is that that's? Yeah, I know him actually. I've met him. Is it Brian May? Is that his name? I think it is. It I A N. I'm th you, when you say I'm thinking the guitar player for uh, uh, Queen, but. Um, uh, yeah, Brian, I think, lives out in Palm Springs. We were just in Palm Springs last weekend. Uh, and Brian Kent is a good singer, so he covers a lot of that stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and Paul is not the type of person to go ahead and have, uh, tr to sing along with tracks. Like, Bieber does that. You know, any pop star is going to sing along with tracks because the sounds they got, they can't get live. A lot of that stuff and the loops and everything. So they got tracks going, and not only for that reason, but they also do it to control. They program the lights and everything. Um, and the guitar, the band's still playing, uh, but they're playing to tracks. And then you'll notice that like a pop artist, they'll pull their mic away and you still hear the singing. Um, and they're singing. I know that, I know for a fact that Dolly Parton did that for years, long before. And, but she would sing along with it, like, exactly. You could never tell. And, because there were times I had a friend that played in her band and there were times where the tape, went down and or the CD went down and um, she was right there didn't miss a beat you couldn't tell that there were, that she wasn't singing so um, I'm not sure um, if she was singing when the track was going but um, I understand that if you're gonna do 300 shows a year or something crazy like that there's no way you can constantly sing that much the voices when I was leading worship I got I was so much more you know when you open your mouth uh, and you're singing um, and I was doing, back then, I was doing two rehearsals and five services. And I was working at other churches doing the same thing. So there was a period of my life where I may have been singing nine or ten services every weekend. And when I was doing that, um, I was constantly getting sick. And it's just, you got your vocal cords open up, you're, you're, you're exposing yourself uh, to anything that's floating in the air. I mean, I constantly was getting colds and losing my voice and... There were Sunday mornings I wake up and I have no voice and I'm like I don't know how I'm going to do it and it would show up by the time I got to church but it was crazy. Okay, go get your lunch, Bruce. Oh, okay, <laughs> no worries. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you so much, Bruce, for doing that. The public image, love that telly. Uh, public image. That's a baritone telly. Telly. That is a baritone. Now let me get it for you. Let me grab it. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, Oh, Pepper, Pepper can claim now I have pants on. <laughs> I should plug it in because it, it's, it's pretty massive. I don't, sometimes I use... So baritone is tuned down. Um, it's tuned down um, a, a fourth. So instead of E, it's a B. So the, the fifth of E is B, but it's, uh, it's, it's an octave below that B. So it's, a, it's not an octave below. It's just basically... Um, it's a, a fourth below on the little flat, but sometimes I'll drop this do like drop D thing But if I do it on this I do a drop a so it's like Freaking in fact, I'll do that right now. I'll go ahead and go to drop a just so you can hear how freaking huge it is That's pretty in tune um, and the reason I bought this one I have another baritone that I pretty much I mean, I guess you could say I gave it to Alex Uh he has it now, and it, I got I have the Dan Electro one with the two pickups. I think just so noisy those lipstick pickups. I love the sound of them, especially clean. But if you put a compressor on or any distortion at all, it just buzzes like crazy. And so at doing session work, especially records, I just can't have that sound. 
it's got to be. So I bought this because it did have these, um, these aren't quite, well, these are kind of like lipstick pickups, um, but they're very glassy sounding. They're beautiful sounding, but they're very noisy. But I bought it because it has this humbucker. Um, and so I think this is a Mexican. Let me see. Yep, made in Mexico. So it wasn't cheap, but I use it nonstop. I use it a lot on Apex Legends and things like that. Um, let me just show you. Like, if I go to this crazy... fun isn't that a great sound i mean how cool is that so so that yeah so i i use this a lot on movies and games uh i don't think i've used it on any pop tracks but uh nux mighty light or other of their products what is that uh, Tom, oh, at Tom Robinson. Oh, wait, did, did Tom, is there somebody? Oh, Tom Robinson. Any thoughts, recommendations, uh, modeling app to practice with using headphones? And Steven Stout. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, Got to head out soon, but love the live stream. Oh, thank you, Steven. Uh, first time I've seen your name there, I think. Maybe not. Uh, Tom Robinson, I think I've seen your name there before. Um, gear, get a Nux Mighty Light or another of their products. Amazing for sale and sounds great on headphones. You know, and some of those products, I remember uh, the big, the one when I was young uh, was the um, Rock Man by Tom Schultz, Schultz or Schultz, I can't say his name, uh, from Boston. He, he was an MIT graduate, he was an inventor, and he invented the Rockman. And it, the, the later ones had out, outputs that you could actually plug it into like record and stuff with it. And if, it, if you really like the tone, you could get that tone on your, you know, on records and stuff. So that was pretty cool. So, you know, maybe get, maybe get something, um, uh, maybe get something that you can um, use beyond just headphones. Of course, you can always take the headphone out and plug it into any, you know, uh, DAW. DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation, which is how everything's recorded now. Uh, there's different brands. Pro, Pro Tools is the biggest one, and Logic is probably second, and then Digital Performer, and there's Studio One, and there's many, many, many of them. So, um, th thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gear, for, for jumping on that. I appreciate that. And thank you, Pepper, for pointing it out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so this is, it's technically a telly. I have another telly. Um, I have a cup, couple tellies. I have that one that um, I got for like 80 bucks at Guitar Center that I have strung up um, uh, African tuning. And then I have my regular telly that used to be, for a good chunk of my, Playing time was probably my main guitar, uh, the 54 reissue, and it's it's a great sounding guitar and it plays great. Um, it's in my gig bag right now, but it's kind of my backup. Um, but um, yeah, so um, and uh, and and there's someone that probably was a pretty big influence on me too. I didn't think about was Albert Lee as far as country stuff goes. Now I'm not a country player. I would never claim to be. Um, Do you want to take a sip? Oh, this is another reason. If I say there won't be a quiz on this, you take a sip. And that's a celebratory sip. If I touch my face, that's a punitive sip. <laughs> if I leave the room, that's another sip. I think I mentioned that one. Uh, if I leave the room, that's more just to fill in the time sip. <laughs> okay. Um, that one, I broke a string last night. So let's um, go back to the acoustic. And if I switch guitars, that's a sip. Josh. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, the public image, yeah, that it sounds huge because it because it's lower, you know, it's just gonna sound if you drop if you go down a half step. I think, I mean, like Van Halen tunes down a half step. I think part of the reason they do that is to give it, make it sound different than everything else that so everybody's standard tuning. 
Uh, but I'll because uh, it just sounds beefier. And I don't know if Eddie used heavy heavier strings for that. Doesn't seem like it because he would bend and whammy and all that stuff. Um, I think my speculation. I have no proof of this. I've never. I should. I'm sure I know people that know Van Halen. I do know people that know Van. But my speculation was that they tuned down a half step because uh, because David Lee Roth could do this thing where he would sing two notes at once, like a throat singer. And if you look up, if you look up on YouTube throat singers, like Tibetan throat singers, you hear these guys that can drone with their throat and um, and then sing on top of it, which is crazy, crazy stuff. And it takes years and years and years of practice to do it. Uh, but I think David Lee Roth, he could, he's just like, oh, he does that thing and he can kind of sing, he can kind of, it's like this weird thing I don't think he has control over, so I think they tuned to that. And, but that's that's just me being weird and thinking, why do they tune down a half step? Um, so, uh, oh, you're back, Bruce. Good. Uh, you didn't miss anything, trust me. <laughs> if you've been here from minute one, you haven't missed anything. Um, but, you know, when I was <coughs> talking about my most influential players, you know, of course, the people in my life, uh, most influential guitar players, but but, and then... You know, people I listen to, the Beatles and the, the Monkeys. And I again, the Monkeys, I thought I was listening to the Monkeys, but I wasn't. I was listening to the Wrecking Crew. Um, and if you haven't seen that documentary, you know what? There's an app um, that you can get. If you, I don't know if you know about this, but it's called Just Watch. Okay? You can download it. And what you do with Just Watch is you enter in all of the... Um, it's a great app. Uh, you enter in all of the streaming things that you have. So if you have Hulu... Apple, we have Hulu, Apple Plus, Disney Plus, uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and then our cable channel. And so we, you enter all of those in there, and then you just type in the movie that you want to see or the show you want to see, and it'll tell you where it is. Um, and I have a lot of streaming things, not so much because <laughs> Netflix comes with, with our T-Mobile account. We bought Beth a new phone. We got a year of Apple Plus for free. My son Alex uh, likes The Simpsons, so he got Disney Plus and gave us his password. And our daughter Emma got Hulu Plus. <laughs> so I'm not paying for hardly any of these. Amazon, you know, that's just Amazon Prime. So um, The Wrecking Crew movie, 2008. Yep, here it is. Okay, let me see where it is. Oh, it's on Hulu. It streams on Hulu. Um, uh, app, uh, Hoopla, Tubi, uh, History Vault, and... Um, and also YouTube. So the Wrecking Crew. Check that out. Check it out. You'll, I think you'll really dig it because most of you are my age, around my age. And the reason it took so long for the movie to come out, Denny worked on it for 20 years or 18 years, I think. The reason it can't, took so long to come out was because um, there are snippets of 125 songs in this movie and there's monkeys in there there's frank sinatra and nancy sinatra and there's pink panthers in there and uh maybe elvis songs and the beach boys and captain and tennille and it's it's crazy all these different um artists that are actually you know these artists that had the wrecking crew play on their record sonny and Cher, uh mamas and papas just anything that was produced in L.A. was generally probably the Wrecking Crew, and it's, it was a it was a small group of twenty to forty musicians. Uh, there's and it wasn't called the Wrecking Crew at the time. It was something that was, you know, declared later. Um, yes, that's right. The Zoom thing has a headphone out. I think all the Roland products have headphones out too. So all those those are almost better. Um, who was the one that asked? Because. You get something like that, like a Zoom or something, you could actually use at a gig. If it's just a little headphone amp, I mean, they make ones that plug into the guitar and just and that's just like this big, and you take a headphone in, and those are great. Um, you gotta be careful. Don't turn them up too loud. Don't blow your ears. Uh, Bruce. Um, yeah. No, we got that question. I think we got that one covered, but uh, yeah. So I am. I don't own any practice amps, but um, I 
like I said, that I do have pedal boards that have headphone outs, and you can totally use those. And like I said, those are more usable, but they're probably going to be more expensive. You probably get a little plug-in cheap headphone amp for 80 bucks or something like that. And so a pedal board, like some of the Zoom stuff, I think you, you'd probably find them used for 80 bucks. Uh, but some of that Zoom stuff is probably two, three, four hundred bucks, and then the Roland stuff is like four hundred to seven hundred, and then you get go up from there. The TC Electronic stuff is going to be six hundred to a thousand, all that stuff. So the, it depends on the brand. Um, so, um, so the, yeah, the the Wrecking Crew guitar players were an influence on me without knowing it. Um, and then I when I figured out that session work was something I wanted to do, then I started getting into session guitar players, and I started getting into Guys like Lee Rittenauer and Larry Carlton stuff. And that's kind of where I left off. Um, the other players that I feel like... Um, uh, oh, I told you about George Benson. Huge influence. Um, I had my neighbor friend, Mark Ramey. Again, non-guitar player, but he was hugely influential on my playing. Um, and he um, he gave me the Breezen album because he didn't like it. Or he probably sold it to me for $2 or something like that. And I took it home and I just was like, oh my gosh. Um, and at the time, This Masquerade was a hit, and I was thinking it was going to be that, and that was the only song on there that was vocal. Everything else was instrumental, and I was like, this is crazy. So I started to transcribe everything I could figure out on that. And then I, he also got me into Charlie Parker, and so I, tried to, I started to create, um, uh, I started transcribing Charlie Parker solos. And that was really, really good for my... Um, for my ears and it was really really good for my playing and so trying to play charlie parker lines um and of course uh, i don't know if i want to play it on acoustic guitar uh, play it on banjo <laughs> so was it a gotcha. like that's scrapple from the apple um what was it don Lee? Once I stop, I can't. I have to go to the top to play it again. That's Don Lee, and I, I intentionally fingered it down here because he actually, pitch wise, he's up here. Um, so I think that was something Carl Verheyen taught me. He said, "Yeah, try to fit it all down here so that you can play it up an octave the way the saxophone, the alto was." Yeah, take a sip because I switched instruments, um, but. Uh, so, I, you know, as a guitar player, a sax player was very, a lot of, in, in fact, that was one of the things when I got into Charlie Parker, I kind of went, oh, wait a minute. Um, I should start, if I want to be unique, I should not just listen to guitar players and copy what they're doing, but I should listen to other, key, other players. So I got into John Coltrane and Miles Davis, uh, Charlie Parker, Eric Dolphy, uh, Stan Getz. Uh, mostly sax players and then also piano players. I really got into piano players. Of course, that's obviously really difficult to emulate. Um, but um, I, because there were a lot of, uh, um, like on a lot of songs, like I remember there was a Al Jarreau record that um, Greg Fillingaines did a really cool, and I know Greg now, but back then I didn't have, I was in Indiana. I wish I knew Greg. Um, but he did a really, really cool keyboard riff, um, you know, solo in one of... Um, uh, and then Larry Williams would do solos too, but uh, uh, on a Al Jarreau song, and I transcribed that on guitar because I really liked his phrasing, and it was something that guitar players would never have come up. Hey, AB is here. AB's like, wait a minute, why is Tom on? <laughs> is Tom doing every day again? No, 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 I'm not doing every day. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Pepper, you're like that with numbers. Totally, 100% understand. Uh, see, other guitar players, I told you about Joe Pass and Terry Kath. I mean, I think one of the best rock guitar players ever. He's the, he was a guitar player for um, uh, for Chicago. Um, also, a hugely influential guitar player on me was, um, was um, uh, Niles, um, uh, uh, Niles Rogers. Uh, and he was the guitar player. I think his, he kind of got started in the band Chic. Remember Chic? They had the song Freak Out, which is a great guitar part. Um, 
Ah, sí. You know, that kind of thing. He, he just was such a great, uh, had a great feel. And so I feel like a lot of my pop playing is a, I'm kind of directly descends from him. Um, a lot of my best ideas, I think, kind of come from just having heard him on so many records for so long. And he's still doing it. In fact, he just recently, I think he survived cancer. Because I think he was pretty seriously sick with cancer. And he's now doing everything. So, um, no, the volume's off. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I'm not plugged in. In fact, if I were going to do Niles, I'm gonna, you guys are going to get a lot of sips in because I'm changing guitars. If I was going to do Niles, I would probably go with a clean sound and a, a really thin sounding Strat if I were to do. I even have a, I think I even have a patch that I called Niles. Uh, let me see. Let me go ahead and, not, I should call it Niles Crane. <laughs> Here's my Bethany one. Let me see. Okay. Uh, boom, boom. Input two. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. In my sound alikes. No, is it Strat Sounds? No, that's Roger. There it is. Uh, and this may be just from one specific song. I'm not sure. That's way too loud. I'm not sure why there's delay on it, but yeah. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that was his influence on me was a lot of, you know, things. And, and I, I, I'm sure I've talked about it and we, um, we, uh, I, I threatened about doing a series on the, on, on here on the live stream of, uh, coming up with part ideas or rhythm guitar. We've talked a lot about strumming and things like that, but when you pick up an electric guitar in a band, there's. The, the world's your oyster and um and so it's really really hard to kind of come up with one idea or any ideas because there's so many things to choose from um and i thought about doing a series on that but um uh niles uh, because he just played he had such a great right hand and really fun ideas on the left um and just so many songs and there was a i remember when i <laughs> i remember vividly freak out in that, that album um it was a hit um, right before I started working at, at a uh, Mexican restaurant. And I remember mopping the floors and, and using nickels to keep the jukebox playing in the, in the restaurant. So that I, and I would almost play nonstop this, the B-side to one of their songs. And it was because it had such a cool guitar thing. i got to find it. I forget what it was called. Uh, but it was such a really fun guitar riff. So... Um, <laughs> So uh, let's see. Uh, oh, the five watt. Yep, the five watt. I've got a Vox. I've got a little Vox amp that's really great. And it does, you know, now I think about it, it does have a headphone out. And I think, am I correct? If you plug in the headphones, it mutes the amp. So you can use it as uh, an amp and a, uh, a headphone amp as well. So, um, yeah, I have one of those little Vox amps. They're actually really, really nice. They're not in here, but um, the only amp I have in here is my Two Rock. Um, and I've yet to even fire it up once. Just not something I'm going to do in here. So. Um, let's see. All right. So let me see who else is on my list. Well, I mentioned Alan Holdsworth. Um, <laughs> I have, uh, uh, I'm changing guitars again. I don't, you know, he was one of those guys where I could not figure out what he was doing. Now, Alan started out on violin. So he was used to a guitar being tuned in fifths. And he's also, I've met him a couple times. Uh, probably three times I met him. He's passed away now. Um, and uh, he, um, I met him once years ago when I went to Phoenix before, when I first moved to California, I uh, went with my roommate to Phoenix and because Alan was playing a show and he was also doing a signing at a, a record store. So uh, that day I went to the record store and he was doing signing. There was hardly anyone there. So I got to meet him and talk to him. And when I shook his hand, 
you know, I was 22 years old or whatever. He, his hand, my hand totally disappeared. He had the biggest hands. And he was a tall, skinny guy. And then I, um, and then I saw a show that night and I just was like, uh, I, I need to quit playing guitar. I, I, I can't, I couldn't even fathom, you know. Um, and when I want to imitate, I'm going to give you a little, like, this is one of those little tricks. It's not, let's see, wait, bigly, I'll go with this. So I got kind of a big lead sound here going. So when I want to, anybody that can actually play a little bit, you, you can steal this. But what I would do is I would, um, play little diminished triads on just adjacent strings. So you're going like 12th fret, 15th, 18th, 12, 15, 18, 12. So that alone sounds like, you know, sounds like uh, holes with Right? But then when you start mixing up. It just, and to me that's, I mean, I'm musical, and I, to me, that's just what Holzer sounds like. It's like, what the heck is he doing? And then his harmony, his chords, and I watch his hands, and he's just like, how? Just an amazing guitar player. And then I, he kind of lost me when he started doing the guitar synth stuff. And I get that. Pat Metheny lost me, too, when he started doing guitar synth stuff. I get it. You want to sound like something other than a guitar. But I just, I don't know. I just, I, yeah, because you can't, on guitar synths, you really don't hear the nuance so much. So like the slides, the bends, the tremolos, the vibratos, things like that. They're not as prevalent on a, when you're going through a synth. And I had a guitar, I've had two guitar synths in my time. In fact, this guitar still has holes in it from when I had it. Because uh, this is the guitar I used for the clinics. And they gave us, uh, Roland gave us guitar synths. And Alex has it now. From Alex, uh, They gave us a guitar synth and I was supposed to do demo on it. And I hated doing demo on it. It's like... Uh, because it's like, oh, you know, here's a piano, and I would, you know, voice the chords to sound like a piano, and then here's an organ, and here's a flute section, and here's a horn section. And, you know, they wanted me to kind of show off what it could do, like, I would you ever use that in a live situation, and I just never would. So, the G, oh, the Rev G20 is loud. Oh, that's great. And it, and yet, it, it can be a headphone amp, too. That's cool. So, you got a double. That's great. Thank you, Tom, for... In, Oh, 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 the one, oh, you're talking about, yeah, the Rev. Oh, the Rev. Yeah, it's funny, the G20. I saw that at the NAMM show for the first time. In fact, the other day I was wearing a Rev20 shirt that um, Sean Tubbs gave me. Because um, I went to the booth and they were, like, giving away shirts. And he was he was uh, working the booth. So, um... <laughs> So, but Holdsworth was a huge influence in a sense. Um, I'm not sure exactly how. I mean, I think I, w I tried to sound and play like him, even though I couldn't. Um, there's some recordings of me in hmm, probably early 90s playing with this one group. And um, I could tell in that era that I was trying to sound like Holdsworth. I was trying to play, you know, kind of weird lines, jagged lines, you know, and... And like I said, I, you know, I, we've talked about this. Somebody was asking about three purse versus uh, caged. And I don't know who that was. I forget who it was. Uh, was it you, Leo? Leo? Was it? It may have been Leo. Uh, but one of the things I like about three purse is that when you do a three purse like a G, they're really fast because it's three notes per string. So you can really, I mean, I'm hammering on, but. Once you've memorized it and you can see it on the fretboard, then you can play snippets of it. And when you do that, it just sounds like you're playing some weird scale, but it's 100% diatonic. 100% G. All I'm doing is I'm playing the bottom two strings of the three string groupings. Or I can play the outside of all of them. I love 
know how it sounds here. It just sounds so outside, but it's not. It's kind of like we were talking about pentatonics the other day. Just start playing a pentatonic scale and just move it around. You know, you can just... That's Lukather showing up in my playing. Lukather would do those um, three fret bends. Like if you're an E minor, you can bend that E up to G. You can bend that B up to D. So when you're in a minor key, uh, pentatonic, there are whole steps, which are two frets, and then there's minor thirds, and that's all you have in, a, in pentatonic scales. Um, and so um, you can bend up a whole step, or you can bend up a minor third. And the minor third one's a little further, but they sound kind of cool, you know. Uh, Dickie Betts, yeah, Dickie Betts was influential, I think, in the sense. I liked, my sister really, really liked Allman Brothers. I liked it. Michael Hedges, Michael Hedges, an amazing guitar player, but I wouldn't say he was influential because I couldn't do what he did. If I if it was something that I was uh, could emulate with my playing, then they started to influence my playing. Um, but Michael Hedges' stuff was so like I didn't understand what he was doing half the time listening to it. This is before Tab and everything. I mean, Ragamuffin, such a great track, and I tried to work it up. I got the Tab for it, and I tried to work it up, and I'm just like, well, this is just not my. I can't do it. Um, but yeah, he was definitely an amazing guitar player. <clears throat> um, and there, there, I mean, Phil, people, will, you know, so many people I know, that, especially if they grew up in the church, they, they're hugely influenced by Phil Keggy. Um, uh, I got a couple of Phil Keggy records and, you know, got into it, but I wouldn't say he was hugely influential um, on me particularly. Um, let's see, who else? Um, oh, you see who else I have on my list. I, I, I mean, I shouldn't have anybody on my list. It should be just so many. There's so many. But so I, uh, I said, you know, the Beatles, uh, Luke, uh, um, sorry, uh, Steve Lukather, Larry Carlton, Lee Rittenauer, Tommy Tedesco is another one. So all session, L.A. session guys. Christopher Parkin, who was a classical guitarist. Alan Holdsworth, Jimmy Page, huge rock influence on me. Um, and, sa and same with Terry Kath. Um, George Benson and Pat Metheny too, and, and uh, Steve Joe Pass were huge influences on me. Um, another some guitar player that influenced me a lot. I think I feel like because I I don't I'm not really hugely aware of who's influencing me until I listen to recordings I did in the past and I go, oh yeah that's right I was really listening to a lot of Richard Thompson. Um, uh, the album uh, let's see Richard Thompson's album. Uh, let's see which one. Thompson, uh, what was the name of that album? It was, in, it was in the 90s. It was with his wife, and they were going through a divorce. And it's funny because Richard and Linda Thompson, not the same Linda Thompson that, let's see. Was it 80s? Mm hmm I'm pulling up his discography. Shoot out the lights. 82. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, you probably we never heard this record. It, it climbed to the U.S. charts in 203. He actually had an album, Top 100, a couple of Top 100 ones. Interesting. Uh, but that's, you know, streaming, more streaming era. Um, but you can check this out. You can listen to this one on streaming. It's Some of the guitar playing on this thing is just great. And at the time, I was doing a lot of kind of, I, was, I would say, alt um, folk music. So my telly was getting used a lot. I was playing. My main rig at that point was a Telecaster into a couple pedals into a matchless Clubman head and that into a cabinet from a Sears Twin 12. And that was kind of my sound. Um, and uh, in fact, I have a, where is that pedal? Do I have it here? Um, where did I get that pedal? Oh, here it is. Yeah. Yeah. These. Oops, I pulled the door up for a minute. 
This is a matchless preamp and a floor pedal. This thing is insane. Now, I wish I had lights on so I know it was on. I know some people have modded these, and I wish I had another switch so I could go between channels because it's actually got, it's technically got two channels. So you're, when it's off, it's on channel one, and when it's on, you're on channel two. So it's just like going through an amp. Um, but it's not a power amp, so you still have to go through a power amp of some kind. But I had this in my rack rig, too. Um, and I think this was pretty expensive um, at the time, but I don't even know what they're going for now. Um, but it's a, it's, it was super duper gainy. I mean, it's a very gainy pedal, and all two. And I actually had it, it, it died, and I, had, I got it all fixed. So whatever I paid for it, I probably spent another two or 300 bucks on it. Um, Bob Dixon fixed it. He's, he's kind of the, good, the amp guy to the stars. He does Eagles and Metallica and, oh gosh, I can't even think of who else he works on. He, a lot of, lot of L.A.-based artists. Um, oh, uh, Rich, uh, Vincent, I'll, I'll have to check that out, Bruce. Yeah, Joe Walsh? Yeah, I, I would say some, there's, I don't know that when I think of myself when I play, I, you know, it's funny when I play, I hear a lot of Lukather when I'm soloing, you know, um, I hear when I'm doing rhythm rock stuff, I hear more like, you know, 2000 pop rock, uh, power pop stuff like Blink-182 kind of vibe for some reason that kind of comes out of me naturally. Um, I like that kind of sound, uh, a lot of energy. Lot, and hollow. Remember, we talked about that. You know, with power chords, I said you can play root fifth root, but you could also just play root and root octaves, and that just sounds more poppy, and it's not as heavy. Um, it's a little lighter sound. So, <clears throat> oh right, uh, I think that Vox amp. Does, I, I think my Vox amp has that. The Rev is yeah. The Rev is cool. I've been hearing a lot about that. And like I said, I checked it out at the Nam show. Um, I don't think there'll be a Nam show this year. I mean, we'll see. They kind of have to cancel these things now. They canceled the Rose Parade, which is crazy. Um, first time they've ever done that. So I, I don't know. This world is all upside down. And I just think people are ruled by fear. But uh, that's just me. Um, but, uh, it, yeah, it'd be a drag to not... I mean, I, I won't mind not having NAMM show. I have a year off from the NAMM show, to be honest. Um, but uh, I think... You know, they'll have it, you know, whatever happens, we'll hopefully have it more controlled. I think if they do have a NAMM show, it may be closed to public. I mean, it's not open to public anyway, uh, but people like me that get passes from companies that just show up and hang out and meet people and play stuff, um, I'm not a buyer. They may limit it to just buyers um, and exhibitors. So that, that's, that could happen. Um, and they could so, but they could probably, if they do that, there probably be a lot of exhibitors that wouldn't even go. So they could make it a lot smaller, but I don't know. And there'd probably be a lot of people that just wouldn't go. Yes. Yeah. No, they were going through a lot of stuff. It's funny because I was watching, uh, remember I told you about classic albums. Here's another guitar player that really, I think is pretty influential on me in some ways. Um, and that is, uh, Lindsey Buckingham, such a good guitar player, plays it with his fingers on electric. Um, he even thought about getting one of those guitars that he plays. The uh, uh, Someone will know. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, Twin 12 is a great amp. Yeah, the reverb on my Twin 12 is heinous, but the tremolo is godlike. It's, it's hilarious because of all the amps I've had in my life, the Twin 12 has the best tremolo. It's just the speed thing is just not big enough. It's not doesn't go slow enough. It doesn't go fast enough. It's kind of got this Midland kind of thing going. But the tremolo is gorgeous <laughs> and the reverb is the worst so it's got the best tremolo i've ever had in any amp and the worst reverb i've ever had in any amp <laughs> it's just awful but I, that could be uh, reverb is one of those things where the, the the tremolo is a tremolo circuit they're probably the same across the board but reverbs i imagine because it's a tank and there's other things involved in that you know maybe my springs are jacked up or something maybe they're flipped over each other i don't know i paid what did I pay for that? Um, sorry, my nose is just mm, take a sip. I paid $145 for that amp at a yard sale 20, probably before we had kids, so uh, 30 years ago. And um, at the time, that was about what they were going for. So it wasn't like I got this amazing deal, but I thought, hey, an amp for $145. And I didn't realize that. In fact, Bob Dixon worked on it. And Bob Dixon 
I spent 400 bucks. He did. He, he totally reworked it. But he, he said, uh, he said, this is his favorite amp of all time. And Bob Dixon, literally, like I said, he does the Eagles amps. He does Metallica's amps. I don't know if he has a website, but he, he, it's, it takes forever to get work done. I think, I think it took him six weeks to get to that and my pedal, uh, because you know, he, it's on the list and then Metallic is on the road and they send him 12 amps that just fried. So he has to work on those and make them priority. So, um, Ooh, Smokey's in the blanket. Mmm, that sounds good. Rick Turner guitars. Thank you, gear. I knew someone would know. Renee, how's it going? Good to see you. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could, I could wave like this and you don't know if I'm flipping you off or... <laughs> It was like, I got a comment and I was like, I knew I was going to get a comment, but on my J John Lennon thing, I talk about uh, the fact that he's, um, 6-8 is such a great, you know, like, it's one of those swaying, you know, I was like. <laughs> right? So it's a, it's a triplet double feel, a double triplet feel. So it's one, two, three, two, two, three. And I'm like, that's the one where people like, well, one, two, you know, they wave the lighters. <laughs> And I said, you would never do it on the eighth notes. Well, the lighter would blow out. And I got a comment. And as I was saying that, as I was saying it in the video, I was thinking, and you can see, almost see it in my eyes, I was thinking, someone's going to say, we don't use lighters anymore. We use our cell phones. And somebody said that. And I, I, even, I even commented the fact that, yeah, you can see in my eyes, I'm thinking, this is a stupid thing to say. But at that point, I was about halfway done with the video. And I'm like, I'm not going to start this video again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so... Um, the, uh, but yeah, all, you know, I would say all the guitar players in the Eagles had some influence on me in some way, uh, because I listened to so much Eagles stuff as a kid. My sister was really into Eagles, of course, and if your sister's into Eagles and you're going to be into the Eagles. And I guess you could say that, uh, my sister was also a very influential non-guitarist in my life as far as, you know, my guitar playing. She, she influenced my guitar playing. And someone else that she really got me into that I'd never heard of was Leo Kotke. Kind of a weird name. He's still performing, still still doing stuff. And he's a master at the 12 string and slide. Um, really, really cool artist. Um, I mean, you could look into him a little bit too. But yeah, so I, 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 I'm definitely going to do another. I'm going to do the, the, I don't know if I'll be able to come up with favorite strumming grooves of Bob Dylan. I've been working on it. But like I said, I can't even find him playing the same groove from measure to measure, let alone from song to song. So that's, it's a toughie. Um, he's got such a great right hand and, and he's not even aware of what he's doing. He's so busy singing. So my friend who's helping me a little bit on this, he, he, uh, um, he pointed out the same thing about Neil Young that I noticed and uh, to me, but he also pointed out the fact that uh, Dylan's right hand is very hard to, emulate that very few guitar players can emulate Dylan and he's a huge my friend's a huge Dylan fan knows every Dylan thing um, in fact I I met the band for Dylan I went to see Emmy Lou Harris at the Roxy in Hollywood because my friend uh, Buddy Miller who's a very good guitar player really cool vibe guitar player Bu Buddy Miller um, and his records are great too um, he was playing guitar so I want to go see a friend support a friend and go see Emmy Lou Harris and um, so they they uh, and if you want to hear Albert Lee, who, like I said, is one of my favorite country players, um, if you listen to Luxury Liner um, by uh, Emmy Lou Harris, I, I apologize if I spell, spell these wrong. Um, that's Albert Lee, and he does this trick, and I'll show it to you. So I've got my electric. Um, he does this trick where basically what he's doing is that it sounds like he's playing. I should I should do a video on this. Um, let's see, I need to go to my I need to go here. Clean sound. Ugh. What is my name? I think it's this guitar. I'm going to change guitars. Let's see what this verb sounds like. And I'm going to 
turn down. You know, I don't need that long a verb. Better. Okay, so I'm going to change to this. I want I want some really good single coil sound. Um, and of course, Albert probably played. I mean, he's got his own signature guitar, and I uh, he had a song called um, Country Boy, which he did on his record, and um, he uh, uh, shoot who covered it, had a hit with it. Um, I may look like a let's see, let's see. I may look like a city slick Rides a mushroom Ain't nothing but a Hush I ain't nothing but a Concrete oh, oh, I know what it was I may look like a city slick Rides a It's kind of a weird corporate record So he, he he did this, and so I, I remember I learned that song, uh, his the the intro to that song, and um, let me see. I, but I got to add a, a dotted eighth. So what I'm adding here is a dotted eighth delay, um, and I'm going to ah eh, sure I can use take delay. And I'm basically putting it 50-50, okay. Delay is louder, that's weird. Okay. Okay, hear that? So if I put two, three, four, uh, let's see. Uh, is that right? Okay, so what's happening there is the, the the delay is an, uh, an, an eight, so I'm playing eighth notes. I'm just doing a descending scale. I'm getting a lesson now. I'm doing a descending scale. Oh, shoot. i got to turn off the delay. Hold on a second. Uh, okay, mute the delay for a second. I'm doing a descending scale, like G scale. Every other note. So I'm going G, E, F sharp, D, E, C, D, B. See? And I'm doing it with a click plane because it's a little easier to find the beat. Um, so uh, what it sounds like I'm playing, it's I'm playing this. But what it sounds like is oh, shoot. Ah. It sounds like I'm playing groupings of four. One, two, three. So now, but if I speed up the tempo, let me go a lot faster. It sounds much better fast. It's almost easier for me to play. Uh, and I'm realizing I'm swinging too much. <laughs> let me go to like, let me try, uh, let me try 128. See what that, because it was at 96. Let's see what this. Okay, oops, got to turn on the delay.
So all I'm playing is eight notes, two, four, da, 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 two, and three, and four, and... If I turn off the delay, it sounds like this. Oh, sorry. One and two and three and four and. But if I put on the delay, it sounds like one and two and three and four, right? That's the tempo is 154 is what I had it set at. Crazy, huh? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I have to have the click. Well, sometimes I can find it without. David Gilmore would do similar things, you know, like a, he would do it, of course, a lot slower, I think. Let me crank up, let me go with a different tempo, um, like 100. I don't know if I'll be, um, let me try to find 100. This is the test. See if I can find it without playing the click, okay? <laughs> so It's hard because it's so, now it's so much slower. Uh, but it's hard to find that eight dot because it's a dotted eighth note that you're playing against. And most most uh, delay pedals, and I'm using, of course, software. Most delay pedals, though, do have a dotted quarter setting. It's it's what the edge uses, you know, like a. So is it. No, see, I'm hitting the. See, I can't hear it. There it is. So I'm playing eighth notes at 100, and those are six. Those are sixteenth notes you're hearing. I haven't messed around with this a while, but but like you could hear stuff like uh, uh let's see, like um, let's see, uh, what would be good? Um, Yeah, yeah. So, what song am I thinking of? Of, the, of I'm just using a delay. I'm just using a standard delay. I mean, it's it's in my it's in Logic. It's just called delay, um, and it's set like I said. It's set about 50-50, um, No feedback, uh, no roll off. It's just bright. I'm trying to make it sound like the guitar is the same. Uh, this just sounded identical, and it's a dotted eighth setting. And then the the reverb I'm using is uh, Valhalla, which is a great fifty dollar plugin. And they have like six plugins, and you can you can have their entire and they have freebies too, so you can go get the freebies. Um, let's see. What Pink Floyd song is that? What am I? Yeah, you just let the effects do the work for you. And that's just with one delay. 
but yeah, it's it 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 takes a while to get it down, but once you got it down, just. That's how he got that sound was dotted eight delays. Um, and he probably used more delay. Like I said, I have the feedback, which is how many times it repeats, not how many times it repeats, but how much it repeats. It's not really a number thing. It's more percentage. Um, I have it set to zero, but if I put it like to 40%, you can hear it keeps going. If I put it to, well, you don't want to put it to hundred percent because it, it will never stop. But like if I put to 80, it practically never stops. problem with this, you make a mistake, it's there forever. <laughs> so you have to be real careful. I can't tell you how many times I hit a bad note with a delay and it just, I'm like, you have to, you're forced to live with it for the next, like, bar. Uh, question from Pepper and Gary C regarding tabs and scales. Oh, okay. Uh, see, Gary, wait, tab from Pepper and Gary C. Gary C. Oh. Where are the tabs? Oh, oh, the, oh, we talked about uh, from, you mean the, the PDFs from the previous lessons? Those are in the Discord. And I don't have any tabs for what I was just doing because I was just doing it on the fly. Um, let's see, I'm giving you, so I'm gonna create, again, I'm creating one that expires. So sorry if you click on this tomorrow. If you click on this in a half hour, it won't work. But there in Tom's, uh, what is it? Tom's bookmarks? Tom's bookmarks, you'll see all sorts of PDFs. Uh, oh, the, the Apogee A to D, oh, Frank, oh, Frank, I don't see Frank here today, but um, yeah, I use uh, the Duet, I think it's 200 bucks for, I mean, sorry, it's 600 bucks for two channels. Uh, the Uno is one channel. Um, yeah, and then the Apogee, like the rack mount ones, get up in the four or five thousand dollar range. I don't have that, but I do really. Apogee converters are the best. They, they're much cheaper converters for the guitar, or for. In fact, I think some PCs even come with something you can just buy a cable if you got the right cable. That can that'll convert. Um, so uh, into it'll do like the DA conversion in the computer. So um, run like hell. Is that what it is? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's it was it's, I, it's, I think it's something off the wall. I can't remember, but um, yeah, and speaking of off the wall, uh, that made me think of uh, Michael Jackson and some of the biggest um, guitar players that influenced me were the guitar players that played, and, and Lukather would fall in this category, the guitar players that played on songs that my band in Indiana did. So I would learn these songs and um, by uh, default, those guitar players, if I had to learn their licks, like we did um, Back on the Road, which I think, it's an Earth, Wind & Fire, we did a lot of Earth, Wind & Fire stuff, but I think Back on the Road was produced by David Foster, and I think that's Lucas on guitar, and because he just shreds on it. In fact, I need to do, um, uh, uh, I, on my Facebook page, I should do a list of your favorite unknown, largely unknown Steve Lukather solo. Um, I'm pretty sure that's Lukather on it. Let me see if, if anybody's put that in the comments of the YouTube video. Um, it's kind of a, it was a, their double, I think it was a double album. It was after their, you know, biggest record, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Back on the Road. And we did that. And it was a, gr we did it for quite a bit. Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, oh, it's actually their website. Okay, or their. I got it. Okay. Live TV from eighty-five. Plus. Stop. Okay, let me see if anyone. Oh, we got a million subscribers. That's cool. Um, well, let me just send you the. Let me just send you the link so you can check this out later if you like rock guitar. Um, it's it's a pretty crazy. Thank you, Bruce. Um, it's a pretty crazy good track, and it's kind of one of those unknown. I'm pretty sure it sure sounds like Lukather to me. If it's not Lukather, it's someone trying to sound like him. I don't know if uh, the album was from, Ra I think it was called Rays or Ra Rays. 
Uh, yeah. That, somebody says, I like Steve Lukather's guitar on this. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. So, um, so uh, <clears throat> okay. What scale were, was I shredding to a while ago? I was just doing a G major scale. Um, let me put it back to 154. Um, so, uh, where's my DAW? Well, look at this. I got two hours. <laughs> Told you I wasn't going to go two hours. And I went two hours. 154. So I'm back at 154. One, 154. Then I got to go back to one feedback. No feedback. And get rid of some of this reverb. So what I was doing was, um, without the delay, I, so the scale I'm basically seeing is like Do, Re, Mi in the key of G. G, D, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. then like I said what I'm doing is I'm going every other note so I'm going G B A C and I'm muting it to give it a very almost like a synthesizer sound right so then when I turn on the here up and down the scale. Yeah, I know. Totally said 30 minutes, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, there was only one video that even came close. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a great exercise. And it's all, I'm using all downstrokes. Okay, so what that tells me is that Feasibly, I could play that lick without the echo. Let's see if I can do it. So I was going. Uh, so basically, I can kind of play it. You love it when I'm frustrated. Uh, that's kind of what's happening when I play the eighth note. Every other string, oops. Oh no, that's not what I want. Aw, why did you change on me? Oh, dang it. Okay, I gotta, I gotta get back to my dotted eighth. And I gotta get. Now you can also harmonize. I mean, well, it's a little hard. If I went with a quarter note delay, like a quarter note. Four. And you just play, if you just play tri uh, triad notes, um, Brian May uh, for Queen would do that. He would do that soloing. I don't want to kill us, but here. See if I can do it. Like if I did that with gain. This is fuzz. <laughs> like a serious amount of fuzz. So 
basically what's happening is the one note's ringing on top of the other note and creating a, a harmony. So if I go if I go B to D, I'm gonna get, first time you're gonna hear B, but then when the B repeats, I'm, it's over the D. And if I go back to B, then you're gonna hear both of them. So it just sounds like I'm going. But I'm actually going. Threaded. Let's see, you can turn off that fuzz. That's funny. You've been here ever since. Yeah, that's true. With that first one, it was so over so fast. That first video I did, it was over in 90 minutes. You probably did. Now you're all like, oh, Tom's doing a video. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check it out in about an hour because <laughs> he'll still be on. So, okay, I'm hitting two hours. I should probably stop because I'm like, I'm going to get tired. And not that I'm trying to work today, but I'm actually thinking about doing the Neil Young video today. Or I may do a review of the, the Gold Tone, um, uh, uh, the Irish Bazooki. I may do that, to film that today. And I'll probably post it on Thursday. I'm going to try to post every Thursday for now a new video, but oh, uh, tough. With me doing this, if I weren't doing this, then I definitely would post every. So... Ooh, my, you gave your dog some Smokies. I love Smokies in a Blank. It's one of my favorite things. I, I loved it when my mom would have company over. They would have a party. She'd make those. I like when she would put, she would put them in, uh, like she'd have a uh, like a fondue pot with barbecue sauce in and she'd just pour them in there and they would get hot. And then you'd pick, take toothpicks, <laughs> like a cheater's, cheater's, uh, cheater's hors d'oeuvres there. So, um, Okay. So, yeah, did you get what I was shedding to there, kind of? I and mean, I could do it at any octave. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be up there, way up there, okay? Uh, let me go back to the dotted eighth. Anywhere, you know, and then you can work your way back up, too. But anyway, you know. Hard to do without a click. Oops, click. No, gosh darn it. Where am I going? Here, click. Eventually, you just like, oh, I'm doing this, and you think about it, and you screw up. Yeah. Now I'm doing G minor, G major.
that's hard. All those downstrokes, you can feel it. I'm, I, I'm not relaxed when I'm doing it, which is part of the problem. You know, one of the ways it cracks me up, but it's this, it's, I kid you not, this actually works uh, for relaxing, um, for playing fat. Oh gosh, I keep doing the wrong window. Sorry. There we go. For doing, uh, for, for playing faster, one of the keys is to relax, right? And that's like one of the hardest things you, to do. Well, one thing you can do, it, it generally works, is pretend you're relaxed, right? So, am I, yeah, so if, if I'm like, if I'm trying to like too hard to like, oh, I gotta get this, I gotta get this, then, um, then invariably you're gonna screw up. But if you're like, I got this, this is easy, you know, and you just kind of almost put on a, that's where you see these kids that are like shredding and then they're just kind of looking around like they're bored. That's actually part of the process of playing faster. You've got to get to a point where you're not thinking about it so much. And sometimes it's just a matter of fooling yourself. Which if you can talk and play at the same time, you probably have something down. Phrygian. Uh, how about G harmonic minor? bed gear <laughs> I need I'm gonna go to bed now too <laughs> I'll see you guys later <laughs> weirdest lesson I've ever taught I'm losing people doing the doing the dotted eighth thing people are like I can't do that that's too hard it's like uh, I'm only doing half of the work God bless you guys I'll talk to you soon thanks for watching uh, maybe hit the like button on your way out and subscribe if you haven't if you're not a subscriber please subscribe but I I think everybody here is subscribing. Uh, yes, I, I will do the Neil Young video. I, 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 it may happen today. I don't know. I don't know that I will do a bunch of them in a row or I'll pepper, you know, come out with another one and another one kind of thing. So anyway, God bless you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.